Hello everyone, and welcome back to Anthropology 201 World Cultures. This is Lecture Series 2, and in this section we will be covering a few different topics, but the big takeaway from this section are the traits and characteristics of hunting and gathering societies. But before we can explore that, we must first look at how this class has divided up the cultures we are exploring. We are going to be looking at cultures that belong to four different economic and food getting strategies. Uh, first, hunting and gathering, horticulture, pastoralism, and finally, agriculture. So before we can look at the cultures themselves, we are going to have a brief overview of economics. All human societies have economic systems within which goods and services are produced, distributed, and consumed. Now, in one sense, the economic aspect of a culture is simply the sum of the choices people make regarding these areas of their life. Now, such choices have important ramifications. For example, choosing to become a farmer rather than an insurance broker may determine where you live, who you are likely to meet, and the sorts of behaviors you will, be ex you will expect in your spouse and offspring. However, such choices are not unlimited. Just take a moment and think about a few different factors that could help determine this. Well, there are three important factors that really, really impact, you know, our choices of our own personal economics. Um, first, our environment, uh, technology, and traditions set the boundaries within which uh, our choices of production, distribution, and consumptions of goods and services are made. Now, every society must have an economic system. Economics deals partly with the things, you know, themselves, the, the tangible things, with the tools used to produce the goods and services. But more importantly, it deals with the relationship of those things to the people and people to one another in the process of producing, distributing, and consuming those goods. Now, economics focuses on production, distribution, and consumption as observed in the industrial world. But what does economics mean for anthropology? Well, economic anthropology studies the three areas, you know, the, the big takeaway from the production, distribution, and consumption. They study them comparatively in all societies of the world, both industrialized and non-industrialized. Anthropologists are interested in understanding the relationship between the economy and the rest of the culture. One aspect of this relationship is that culture defines or shapes the ends sought by the individuals, and also the means to achieve those ends. Society and economy are interdependent in other ways. For instance, the way in which production is organized has consequences for the institution of the family and for the political system. For example, in southern Mali, where most people live by agriculture and where land is abundant, Children can help farm when they are very young. Thus, families tend to have as many children as they possibly can. Large families can cultivate more land and therefore are generally wealthier than small families. In turn, the leaders acquire the political power and social prestige 
that derives from having wealth and numerous relations. Now, although economists often attempt to do so, it is difficult to separate the economic system from the rest of the culture. Economics is embedded in the total social process and cultural pattern, which begs the questions, uh, what is economics and what does economics encompass? Well, economics is defined as the study of the ways in which the choices people make as individuals and as members of societies combined to determine how their society uses its scarce resources to produce and distribute goods and services. Now, much of formal economic theory is based on assumptions derived from observing Western industrialized societies. And as a result of this fact, there is a long-standing debate as to how applicable economic theories are to the understanding of small-scale, non-industrialized societies. So, Western economists assume that individuals, as well as corporations, are motivated by desire to maximize material well-being. Now, other societies uh, economic principles may be based on reciprocity or redistribution, which emphasize cooperation and generosity, and not to maximize material well-being. Even in the United States, there is an increase in the extents to which people fail to maximize their economic well-being. Now, for example, the notion of financial profit does not always dictate the economic behavior. For, so, when you finish with class or school today, um, you will be confronted with you know, a series of decisions. Should you reread the notes from today to gain an educational profit? Should you study for another course? Maybe order pizza? Uh, hop on Steam, play a few games, uh, play with your kids, socialize with your friends, should you stay up late and work on that project for work, or should you just go to bed, get some extra sleep? Now, you will make your choice on which of these to do based on some sort of calculation of benefit. Now, however, the, that benefit is not necessarily reducible to financial profit, or in, I, or in our example, educational profit. Now, if we dive deeper into this example, it is quite possible for you to believe that you would ultimately make more money if you study and get higher grades. However, your context, or your choice, is set in a context in which money is likely to be the most important element of value. Now, we also value our friends, we value our children, our leisure time, and many, many other things as well. So, if you choose to socialize instead of studying, your choice is rational because it is based on some sort of calculation of your needs and goals, but it is not necessarily led to the greater profit. Now. To understand the various cultures, anthropologists face two related problems. First, they must analyze the broad institutional and social contexts within which people make decisions. And second, they must determine and evaluate 
the factors that motivate individual decision making. One way we can think about any given economic system is to consider a series of fundamental issues that all societies must face. Because all societies must acquire the food and other materials necessary to their lives, all societies must engage in production. Now, to do so, all societies must acquire resources, such as land and water, and all must have some system through within the rights to use such resources are allocated. Now, however, resources in and of themselves do nothing. They need to be produced into goods. And to do this, the society need to have some system of organizing in specific ways the uses of the resources of production. For example, in hunting and gathering societies, they rely on the plants and the animals in their territory. However, they do not simply forage and eat randomly. Typically, the men hunt while women gather, thus they are organized to produce. Additionally, people in all societies exchange and consume the products of production. So each society has a system of, dis of distribution and in each there are distinct styles and patterns of consumption. Now, how do we allocate natural resources? The things that members of a society need to participate in the economy are called productive resources. And the access to productive resources is an aspect that is dealt with in every culture. People everywhere require access to land and water. Now what about access to knowledge? Access to knowledge that allows people to make and use tools plays an important role in all societies. There may be additional important forms of knowledge that can be controlled as well, such as the knowledge of healing or the knowledge of religious ritual. Now, access to knowledge plays a critical role in modern American society. This is shown between the relationship between university degrees and income. A person with a bachelor's degree, according to, the, to a study conducted in 2008, earned 28% more than a person with an associate's degree and 50% more than a person with only a high school diploma. Now, an important point of contrast between economic systems is the extent to which individuals and groups have access to productive resources. Now, in general, Differential access to resources develops as population and social complexity increase. In some societies, most people have access to, res uh, to resources necessary to survive and fully participate in society. In others, access to these resources may be exclusively or disproportionately invested in particular social groups. So again, if we look at the US, only 3% of the students from America's most selective schools come from households in the lowest 25% of the income scale. So this shows 
that family wealth plays a critical role in determining access to knowledge and access to such knowledge plays a critical role in future wealth and social position. Now, small-scale economies have a limited number of productive resources and most everyone has access to them. Whereas large-scale societies have a great many resources, but access to them is limited. This can be seen through the comparison of access to resources among hunters and gatherers, pastoralists, horticulturalists, and agriculturalists. Now, every society has developed a set of rules governing the allocation and use of resources. We should also know that the degree to which humans are territorial varies widely throughout the world. And the notion of personal property is absent in most societies that base livelihood or subsistence pattern on food collecting, pastoralism, or horticulture. Now, that is a brief breakdown of economics. But in many cases, a society's economic system and their political system can be incredibly difficult to determine where one ends and the other begins. This is true because more often than not, one is directly influenced by the other. And that influence can be felt going in both directions meaning the economy affects the political system while at the same time the political system affects the economy. So since this is the case we will also be looking at a brief overview of political organizations of different societies. So the term political organization refers to the way in which power is distributed within a society so as to control people's behavior and maintain social order. All societies are organized politically, but the degree of specialization and the formal mechanisms vary considerably from one society to another. They vary based on three important factors. First, the extent to which political institutions are distinct from other aspects of the social structure. So, for example, in societies political structures are barely distinguishable from economic kinship or religious structures. Now, the second uh, factor is the extent to which legitimate authority is concentrated in specific political roles. The third and final factor are the level of political integration, meaning the size of the territorial group that comes under the control of the political structure. Now, it is these three principles that is the basis for the four types of political structures that we are going to look at. And those are bands, tribes, chiefdoms, and states. So first is band societies. They are the least complex of the list. Bands are characterized by small 
and usually nomadic populations of food collectors. Bands can range in population from 30 to several hundred, but most band societies are between 30 and 50 people. Now, the population is dependent on the food gathering techniques. If they gather more food, they have a higher population. Uh, less food, less population. Now, bands are generally associated with a particular piece of territory, but they rarely have individual property ownership of land or livestock. This means that band societies place a high value on sharing, cooperation, and reciprocity. So bands have little role specialization and are highly egalitarian. Now because bands are closely associated with foraging, it is generally thought to be the oldest political system. Now, bands have four distinct traits. First, they place high value on individual and social cooperation. Second, band societies have the least amount of political integration, meaning different bands are independent from each other and are not parts of a larger political structure. The third distinct trait is that political decisions are often embedded in the wider social structure. Now, to elaborate on this further, because bands are composed of kin, it is difficult to distinguish between purely political decisions and those that we would see as a family, economic, or religious decision. And now, the fourth trait is that leadership roles in band societies tend to be very informal. So, instead of official leaders, band leaders are often older men who are respected for their experience, wisdom, uh, good judgment, and general knowledge. Okay, next is tribal societies. Now, where we see bands being associated with food collecting, tribal societies are found most often among food producers such as horticulturalists and pastoralists. Now, since food producing is more productive than food foraging, the populations found with food producers are larger. So, tribal societies' populations tend to be larger, denser, and more sedentary than bands. Tribal societies are similar to bands in a number of different ways. First, both are egalitarian to the extent that there are very few marked differences in status, rank, power, and wealth. The second way that they are uh, similar is that there is no centralized leadership. The leadership in tribal societies is informal and not vested in centralized authority. A man is recognized as a leader by virtue of certain personality traits such as wisdom, integrity, intelligence, and the concern for the welfare of others. The third and final way that they are similar is the decisions that are made are through group consensus. Now, the major difference 
between tribes and bands is that tribal societies have certain pan-tribal mechanisms that cut across and integrate all of the local segments of the tribe into a larger whole. Now, these mechanisms, these pan-tribal mechanisms, include tribal associations, such as clans, age grades, and secret societies. Now, a clan is a group of kin who consider themselves to be descended from a common ancestor, even though individual clan members cannot trace step by step their connection to the clan founder. Now, an age grade or age class is a form of social organization based on age within a series of such categories through which individuals pass over through the course of their lives. So, as you get older, you pass into a different social organization. The last one, secret societies, are defined by the use of some aspect of secrecy as an indicator of exclusivity. Now, these pan-tribal mechanisms usually only come into play when the tribe is against external threats. And once the threat is dealt with, the local units return to their anonymous state. The next on our list is chiefdoms. So, in bands and tribes, the local groups are economically and politically independent. The authority is decentralized, and populations tend to be egalitarian. In addition to this, the roles are unspecialized, populations are small, and economies are largely subsistence-based. <clears throat> but, as societies become more complex, with larger and more specialized populations, their need for a more formal and permanent political structure increases. So we get chiefdoms. And in chiefdoms, we see that political authority is likely to reside with a single individual acting alone or with a council. Now, chiefdoms differ from the previous societies in that chiefdoms integrate a number of local communities in a more formal and permanent way. Chiefdoms are made up of local communities that differ from one another in rank and status. Now this is based on their genealogical proximity to the chief. The closer you are related, the more important you are. It is also worth noting that Chiefdoms are rarely under the leadership by a single chief. More often than not, they are led by several political units, each headed by its own chief. Now, chiefdoms also differ from tribes and bands in that chiefs are centralized and permanent officials who have higher rank, higher power, and higher authority than others in the society. Now, unlike the past societies where no one had any real power, the chief does. The chief can make judgments and punish wrongdoers as well as settle disputes. The chief can also distribute land chief can also draft people into the military or assign laborers to public works. The chiefs are also central to the society's economy. They are the central authority in charge of redistribution. Now, 
the subjects will give surplus food and goods to the chief. This is often through the insistence of the chief, but it's through the chief. The chief will then store this and redistribute it at a later time in the form of communal feasts. This not only serves as a mechanism of economic redistribution, but also as a mechanism for expressing loyalty and support to the chief. Okay, now the last political system, state societies. A state can be defined as a hierarchical form of political organization that governs many communities within a large geographic area. Now, states collect taxes. They recruit labor for armies and civilian public works projects. And, and this one's key, they have a monopoly on the right to use force. They are large bureaucratic organizations made up of permanent institutions with legislative, administrative, and judicial functions. So, in our previous systems, bands, tribes, and to a lesser degree chiefdoms, have political structures based on kinship. The state systems of government organize their power on a supra-kinship basis, meaning a person's membership in a state is based on his or her place of residence and citizenship, rather than on kinship affiliation. Now, the authority of the state rests on two important foundations. First, the state holds the exclusive right to use force. So any act of violence not expressly permitted by the state is illegal and thereby punishable by the state. And second, the state maintains its authority by means of ideology. So, for the state to hold on to the power over long term, there must be a philosophical understanding among the citizens that the state has legitimate right to govern. Now, states are characterized by a large number of specialized political roles. We see law enforcement, tax collection, uh, dispute settlement, recruitment of labor, and protection from outside invasions. Now, state societies are also very segregated with many different socio and political hierarchies. The political system was a hierarchy and the society itself is a hierarchy. States are where we see the most social inequality. States are stratified societies and they come in two types. Class systems and caste systems. Now, in a moment, I am going to put a table up on the screen. Now, this table is a quick breakdown of the four different types of political systems, band, tribe, chiefdom, and states. And it gives a breakdown of their population size, their leadership type, their economic form, settlement types, and it gives a few example cultures. Now, this table is a great reference tool, and I highly recommend that you copy it down. So, 
this has been a brief overview of political systems. It is important to note that political systems and economies can exist together, meaning that a culture can be labeled as a hunting and gathering society, which is the economic label, or as a band, which is the political label, or they can be labeled as a hunting and gathering band, bringing both classifications together. Now, with our class, we are looking at different cultures from around the world. We have divided the course into different sections based on economies and food getting strategies. So the first category we are going to explore are food collectors or hunting and gathering societies. So first, a brief on the characteristics and traits of hunting and gathering societies. Now, among food collectors, weapons used in hunting animals and tools used in gathering plants as well as the knowledge to make and use these are considered productive resources. If you remember back to our spiel on economy. Now the technology is simple and the tools are handmade. Now, People take great care to ensure that they have access to the tools necessary for their individual survival. For example, among the Hadza of Tanzania, men spend a lot of time gambling. However, their bow, bird arrows, and leather bags are never shared or gambled, because these items are essential to survival. Now, besides knowledge and tools, land and water are the most critical resources for food collectors. So we can find many forms of land occupation among them. The requirements of a foraging lifestyle generally mean that a group of people must spread out over a large area of land. Hunting grounds are not exclusively owned because flexible boundaries have an adaptive value. For instance, ranges can be adjusted as the availability of resources change in a particular area. The Juhonsi of the Kalahari were hunting and gathering. Their settlement pattern was centered on watering holes and their camps were located about one day's round trip walk to the watering hole so about 12 miles. Now the camp would move around the hole and their territory would be considered owned by the Juhasi but they did not consider it owned by themselves. Outsiders said oh yeah that's Juhasi territory they own it but the Juhasi themselves, they did not consider that they, they owned it. However, permission had to be asked when others wished to use the land's resources. Now, permission was rarely refused. Although, you know, visitors may be made to feel unwelcome to get them out sooner. Now, hunters and gatherers require freedom of movement not only as a condition of success in their search for food, but also as a way of dealing with social conflict. Hunting bands are kept small in order to exploit the environment successfully. In such small groups, conflict must be kept to a minimum. So when arguments break out, individuals can move 
to other groups without the fear that they are cutting themselves off from access to valuable resources. That's how we deal with things here in the U.S. Because we are, you know, a large, diverse group. We have a large, very, very large area. So if we have problems with individuals that are near us in proximity, we, we just move. Now, in small societies like this, they have to work together. They are a close-knit family. So if a problem does arise and they can't get over it, there's nowhere for them to go. They need each other. Now, if land were individually owned or even communally defended against outsiders, the freedom of movement in hunting societies would be severely limited. So because of this, we do not see the individual ownership of land. Now, there are certain traits that we can assume or derive from food collecting economies based on their tendencies. Uh, claiming and defending a territory requires time, energy, and technology that foragers choose not to expand. So, territoriality can lead to conflict, and as we just stated, they steer clear of conflict. Also, another trait is the amount of communal control of land varies cross-culturally, meaning one culture will you know, have a different communal control than the next. Now, they will also have open or flexible boundaries if animals are mobile and supplies are unpredictable. But they are more likely to live in a permanent settlement and maintain greater control over land in areas where supplies are plentiful and predictable. So this concludes lecture series 2 part 1 so be sure to watch part 2 where we will identify and define the nine parts of culture that we will be examining in this course. We will then take those parts of culture and apply them to the Juhasi.